Hi, you're going to be doing a, a lab where you go outside and look at the pollinators visiting the flowers. And it takes um, a little bit of, of patience to do this lab. Uh, you're going to set aside a couple of hours uh, in total by the time you get there, get set up and, and collect your data. You probably want to review the uh, biology of pollination. Pollination is a really good example in ecology of mutualism. We have the, the case where the flowering plants and the insects co-evolved. And uh, the, the point of pollination, the, the actual process, is where the, the uh, pollen is getting transferred from the anther to the stigma. And uh, they try to do it between different individuals so that you have uh, outcrossing and you avoid inbreeding. And uh, you probably need to review way back when you learned all the parts of the flowers, but the stigma is the sticky part at the top of the uh, uh, carpal or or uh, pistil, which is the female part of the plant. And then the uh, female part of the plant has the egg down in the bottom. And the male part of the plant is the stamen, and the top part of that is the anther. And that produces the pollen, which has uh, uh, sperm in it. And so uh, the whole point is to try to get this pollen grain uh, from uh, the anther of one plant to the stigma of another plant. <clears throat> And the wind can do it, and that's not very good because uh, you have to produce tons of pollen in the hope some of it gets to where uh, you want it. So that's not terribly efficient. So uh, this uh, using uh, an animal vector to move the pollen that the animals honed in on looking for your kind of flower is probably the best way of doing this. And it's very successful. Flowering plants have become very successful. So flowering plants really exploded in diversity following the uh, demise of the dinosaurs uh, at the uh, Cretaceous tertiary boundaries where we find um, all this diversity in flowering plants. So this sexual reproduction strategy of using uh, the animals to assist you with your outcrossing has helped enormously. This is a picture from an area in the uh, in China, up in the mountains near in the Tibetan Plateau, uh, where we think the first flowering plants evolved. And there's a beautiful diversity of different types of flowering plants in this area. And uh, through sexual reproduction, of course, you get much more variable offspring because you're shuffling up the combinations of genes. And that's going to be good for for uh, evolution and uh, making sure that you have enough variety that if the environment changes, you've, you've got some good individuals in your population that are going to be able to survive and go on to reproduce. So why do animals do this work for the plants? Well, they get a reward. They're getting uh, uh, either nectar, which is a sugary solution, uh, which the the plants produce in nectary glands, and uh, they can actually match the, the uh, energy requirements for the particular animal with the amount of sugar in their nectar, and they're producing the sugar with photosynthesis. Um, and, and pollen, so you can have uh, a very high protein in the pollen. Bees will uh, even eat it, and, and beetles will eat it. And some flowers will actually have two different types of pollen. They'll have the ones with the sperm that they want transferred, which will stick on the outside of the bee. But then they have other pollen that's very nutritious that the, the bee can take and use it for food. There's this concept we're going to be dealing with in this lab of pollination syndromes, where you can predict what kinds of animals are being attracted to the plant based on the shape and the color and the rewards. And plants advertise their pollen with um, uh, and their rewards with their colors to attract certain pollinators. Um, they also maybe produce uh, little runways to show the pollinator where to go. Um, this is a picture of the uh, uh, plant that was in the Longwood Gardens, and uh, it is attracting the, and it's called the corpse flower, and it's attracting flies at night, and it's kind of like a dark purpley, like bloody looking uh, flower, and then it gives off this horrible smell, and that way it'll attract flies and beetles. 
and they cut a little hole down around the back of the flower so you could see in and uh, you can see where the pollen the yellow pollen is being produced and below that are the stigmatic surfaces and they collected a bunch of that pollen so that they can go and pollinate another corpse flower with it when it flowers and uh, and it makes this massive huge uh, flower and it's only open for like 24 hours tracks all the bugs and then uh, and then it'll close up and produce the seeds uh, bees we know are very important uh, pollinators we can see this bee with the little pollen sacs on his legs they uh, live on the nectar uh, to feed the larva but they also eat the pollen they have a good sense of vision and smell they really like yellow and blue colors um, and they can see ultraviolet uh, light as well but they're not good at seeing red and some of the flowers will actually have honey guides little uh, bee platforms that they can land on and then uh, basically hone them in on where the where the pollen is you can see this little yellow flower when you look at it with uh, uv light um, actually uh, is highlighting where is the center of the flower so the bee can see okay go land here and then and go in there to get your reward butterflies and moths they're also guided by sight and smell butterflies see red and orange so a lot of your butterfly flowers are going to be red and orange and they often have this little long tube so that they can send their little uh, proboscis which is like a big long drinking straw and they uncurl that and put that down the tube so they can drink the nectar out of the bottom uh, moth pollinated flowers because moths are out at night um, are usually white or pale in color and usually have a very strong uh, sweet smell to attract the the moths and so um, if you think you're, you're out there looking at the pollinators during the day and you think you're seeing a uh, moth um, they usually moths are usually out at night and also the moths when they land will have their wings flat you see sometimes in the morning you'll come out and you'll see a moth sitting there with its wings all out whereas when a butterfly lands it has its wings folded up like in the picture um, so you should be able to tell those guys apart uh, bird pollinators like hummingbirds and honey catchers um, they don't have a good sense of smell but they do love the color red um, so the flowers don't tend to have an odor but they do tend to be red uh, lots of uh, nectar in them and then you often get these uh, the bottom one there is the honey creeper you often get these uh, uh, sort of like trumpet shaped flowers or, or little uh, tubes where they uh, stick their long beak in and then their little long tongue goes down and laps up the nectar so they have usually a long fused petals the tubular corolla and the pollen is large and sticky so it tends to this uh, scanning electron micrograph of, of uh, pollen grain showing that it's, it's got these little spikes to stick on the outside of the face and then when it goes to the next flower um, the face will touch the stigma and transfer the pollen that way so we have these pollination syndromes now if you look in your lab book that you have um, uh, terrestrial ecology lab book um, it has a key for identifying the different insects that come to your uh, to your flower that you're going to be watching but it also explains the different pollination syndromes so what are the different um, things that are attracting those particular pollinators and so there's a table showing you what the pollinators are looking for and uh, there's a, a key to figure out from looking at your flower what kind of pollinators are likely to be attracted to it uh, and I, I do have a I set up a, a little blog online to take a look at these different um, pollinators and introduce you to it so I'm going to stop here and uh, open that up here's a little blog I set up about the pollination lab uh, giving you some ideas and some resources and uh, so there is a, a paper that I've given you a link to that explains in detail about these pollination syndromes and specifically related to the lab is what I've based our lab on and then there's a really great blog uh, called the lives of other bees and uh, there's a couple of posts in there about pollination syndromes with these uh, graphics included that explain in the graphics what each of the um, uh, different types of pollinators were being attracted to so I, I uh, recommend taking a look at this short little blog and it, it 
it links you to some of these resources that you're going to find help explain what it is you're doing. As you get ready to do your lab, uh, take a look in your lab in the lab book on page three. It goes over all your safety information because um, you do want to make sure that you're going to be safe. So always bring a, a, a fully charged cell phone in case of emergency um, and you're going to need it for this lab anyway. Um, uh, make sure you've, you're wearing comfortable shoes, adequate clothing. Uh, and uh, bring a bottle of water, something to snack on. You're going to be out there for a couple of hours. And uh, if you have difficulty finding a safe place to do the lab, reach out to me and I, I will give you some suggestions. So the weather, check the weather forecast before going out. Dress appropriately. You don't want to get heat stroke. Bring some water. You don't want to get sunburnt. Uh, bring some um uh, sunglasses to protect your eyes, some sunblock for your skin, wear a hat, uh, and uh, make sure that you've you're got your uh, weather app on and your phone so that it can alert you if there's any storms coming. Um, and so you want to make sure that you go over all of the, there's just a, a couple of pages of safety tips and ideas and things to keep in mind uh, in the lab book. And then read the lab book instructions. So there's background information on uh, why we're doing the lab and what, what you're going to be doing out there. Uh, in your lab book, there's the key for identifying the different insects. There's a key to figuring out what pollination syndrome your plant is following and uh, a table of what insects are looking for in, in the different types of pollination syndromes. Also, before you go, you're going to try to uh, scope out a location. So find a place that you've got uh, a variety of different uh, types of flowers with different pollination syndromes, uh, somewhere that you'd be able to sit for, for an hour and uh, look at what's visiting the flowers. You're going to be picking out two different flowers that have uh, different syndromes. So you want to find a, a spot to do that. Don't forget to bring your field book with you um, and read over the instructions of what you're doing when you're in your, your comfortable air-conditioned home as opposed to sitting out in the hot sun trying to read the instructions. You're going to need, by the time you get to your site, find your flowers, get, a, get set up and everything, and collect the data, uh, a maximum of two hours to do this. So one of the places you might want to uh, try taking a look at is a garden uh, local to you where somebody can tell you what the flowers are. There's uh, often in the community gardens at the college, which are right across from Scott Hall, there's usually some flowers in that area or some flowers around campus. And uh, so you, you can uh, sit there and watch the flowers. Uh, you want uh, uh, cameras, your phone camera is fine because you have to, in your lab, you're asked to take pictures of certain things, uh, which, which includes taking a photo of where you are or the habitat and then taking a photo of the flowers that you're, you're uh, actually looking at. And you're going to be putting those photos on your lab blog. Um, you obviously want the weather app uh, to warn you of any storms, but you also want to use that because it can give you the current temperature. Um, and if your phone isn't uh, set up to do that in Celsius, you can always use a conversion on your phone to put that into Celsius. It'll give you the humidity, it'll give you the wind speed, and all of these can affect how many pollinators that you find. Uh, you're going to want to have uh, some sunblock, hat, sunglasses, um, a pencil so you can you've got a data sheet in your lab books so you can write that right on there and in the past students have often brought a blanket to sit on because you're going to sit there for for an hour taking a look at the at the pollinators and counting the pollinators so really um, the only equipment from the lab kit you're going to need is a lab book and uh, make sure you bring that with you So some tips before you go out, take your allergy medication. If you're allergic to bees, make sure you have your EpiPen. I've had no one stung doing this lab, but uh, you always want to be prepared. Pick a place that you see active pollinators. So if there's, there's nothing going on, uh, you're not going to see anything. And it's okay if you don't get very many pollinators, but it's more fun if you do. Um, 
if you're looking at uh, some flowers in a spot and there's a few of them in the same area that you could keep an eye on, uh, you can choose a cluster. There might be five or six flowers. And uh, just as long as they're the same uh, species and the same color, because uh, the color is going to be influencing who the pollinators are. And just just note how many flowers there's a spot in your data sheet in your lab book to uh, note how many flowers you have observed. Uh, it, it's good to take a friend and uh, uh, when we do the lab in a face-to-face -face class what we usually do is work in pairs and uh, one person will watch the flowers for 10 minutes uh, while the other person records the data and then they'll switch off every 10 minutes. You're going to do a maximum, you're going to do a an observation for a total of 30 minutes on on the uh, flowers. So just set a timer on your phone for 30 minutes and you're going to record how many have uh, landed on the flowers and uh, what type of, of pollinators they are. So you're going to observe the flowers for exactly 30 minutes and then you're going to just uh, take tallies the number of visits uh, by bees or bumblebees or flies, whatever there is. And if you need to take a little break, just stop your timer, come back and uh, after you get your, your little break. Um, sometimes when you're looking at your pollinators, they will uh, fly everywhere but on your flower. Don't count them. Uh, I know it's frustrating, but they seem to go everywhere but where you're looking. Um, also, uh, if it flies away and comes back again, you count it again. So you just put a another tally. So just tally up uh, how many times it lands on your flower because uh, you don't know whether you've seen this bee before or not most of the time. Um, if you are taking a friend, don't forget to social distance. Don't want you guys getting each other sick. That's a, that's a lizard that in order to uh, uh, fool its predators, it, it uh, flips its little collar up around its head and it looks like a little flower. So uh, don't forget to take pictures that you're going to need. Email them to yourself or you can, from your phone, you can load them up to your Google Drive or to your OneDrive. And that way, when you're making your blog later, uh, you've got the pictures right there. So it's, it's a lot easier to do that right away instead of trying to find them later. Um, also, I mark my location in Google Maps. I take a screenshot and send that to myself as well so I can stick that up on my blog. Um, and we have a form that you're going to be entering your data in. And I'm going to show you that form. And you can actually do that right out there in the field. You can do it back at home. You can see in the picture I have the form up on my computer uh, so that I can put in the data. But uh, it, it's something you can do right out there and because you're going to put the, the total number of bees and flies and beetles and whatever pollinators you have. If there's other pollinators you see out there or things that you don't know, just see if you can grab a picture of them and maybe we can help you identify them. So if you're out there and you have a, a connection on your phone, you can go directly to the, the form for inputting the data. What this is going to do is it puts it all into an Excel spreadsheet for us and then the next week we can analyze the class data instead of uh, trying to type this in all in separately. And so the form's pretty straightforward. Uh, you put it in your name, the date you've collected the data, the name of your flower. Now uh, in your lab book it explains that if you can't name your flower, if you don't know what kind it is, um, send it to me, ask to me. And in the meantime you just give it um, a name that's going to be labeled with your last name, the color of the flower, and if there's more than, than one of that kind, you, number one or number two. So it could be Smith Yellow One or, or Glen Red One. Um, so you put your flower name, but if you do know your flower, put this uh, in and you're going to put a form separately for each flower. So you're going to go out and you're going to look at one flower or maybe a little cluster of that kind of flower for half an hour. Then you're going to find another one, a different one, and you're going to look at that one for half an hour. Put the data in separately for, for each flower. So uh, is this a new flower or are you updating a previous submission. You might have been putting in a submission and then you screwed it up and uh, so you put in, uh, in a correction or uh, this is a new one. 
how many flowers are you looking at? Is it just one? Or if you've got more than three, put the number in there. What is the flower color? So let's say I can put my name in here. Might as well fill this out for you. The date collected. Um, I am going to put in today. The flower name. I don't know what flower it is. It is Glenn. Add one. Uh, this is a new submission. How many flowers? Just looking one. It was a red color. You could have other though. You might have a different color than these, or you might have a combination. It might be a multicolored flower. And then put in the time. So right now I'm looking at um, nine. 9.50, so that's 9 o'clock, 9.50 in the morning. Um, so use a 24-hour clock here. That way everybody's using the same clock for putting in their data. And then I'm in, I well, let's say I'm in a garden, field, lawn, roadside, vacant lock. I'm in a park. And put in wherever you are. The weather today is sunny. The temperature today is, well, I have to transfer that from Fahrenheit to Celsius. I've got 24 Celsius. Relative humidity, let me take a look. That is 82%. Yuck, it's humid. And the wind speed today is 2 MPH miles per hour. When I look exactly where my flower is situated, I'm in a partially shaded spot, but you're going to take a picture. So you're going to have a picture of this to include. You're also going to take a picture of your flower and you're going to take a picture of your location. You're not going to submit these pictures here. You're going to use those on your block. And then in my 30 minutes, I total up my tallies. I had uh, three honeybees, two bumblebees, there are no sweat bees or little tiny bees, no flies. Let's say I was lucky I got a butterfly. I'm making this up by the way. Um, or let's just say I got something that's not on the list. There might have been a spider sitting in my flower. So I might have had one spider and um, then there's Let's say I had a Japanese beetle that I wanted to put in or something, or an ant or something else. Whatever it is, add that in that box. And then you might want to make a note that something that happened that you felt like affected it. So it might be you fell into the flowers and scared away the pollinators or it started to storm. Whatever it is, you put that in and then you just submit and now you can go and uh, submit another response it does remind you go to your lab blog update the lab page with your photos and data from your field book so do that um, as soon as you get home and uh, that way your lab blog is up to date while you still remember what was going on but I can just click submit another response and I can go and put in my my second flower. So you're going to go out, you're going to see, you're going to pick a location, take a picture of your location, pick a flower, take a picture of your flower, try to figure out what you think is probably the pollinator for that flower, and watch it for 30 minutes, just take tallies of what visits, that, and total up those tallies, and enter them into this uh, form. Um, then you're going to pick a second flower with uh, that you probably would predict a different pollinator and you're going to do the same thing. You're going to watch it for 30 minutes, tally up all the different types of pollinators you see and enter it into this form. Then when you go home, oh, take a picture of both flowers and then when you go home, uh, put the data in into this form if you haven't, but then update your blog with the information from when you're outside. And then next week we will analyze, I'll share that Excel a spreadsheet that this form feeds into and we'll analyze the data together. Have fun!